the Center for the Study and Teaching of Writing at The Ohio State University. This is Writer's Talk. I'm Doug Dangler. Kaylee Jones is a writer who helped found the MFA program in writing at Long Island University's Southampton campus and the MFA program in writing at the Wilkes University. She is the daughter of James Jones, author of From Here to Eternity and The Thin Red Line. Her latest book, the memoir, Lies My Mother Never Told Me. This book, she covers her life with her father and mother, alcoholism and recovery, and coming into her own as a writer and person. Welcome, Kaylee Jones, to Writer's Talk. Thank you. Well, this is a great book, and I finished it uh, last night. And as I was reading through the book, I was a little worried at the very beginning that it might be sort of a mommy dearest with the literary bend. Uh, but it's not, because uh, you're a very good writer, and uh, you work hard at uh, finding the humor, I think, in the situations, and the humanity in the situations of having, uh, having a, a very unconventional childhood and, a, and some difficulties with your family as you grew older. So tell me about some of the difficulties uh, that your mom presented and the lies that she didn't tell you. Well, first about the, the, the mommy dearest approach, I was so concerned about that that I really, really worked hard mm -hmm. to find a, a neutral kind of approach to the story and to not uh, give you an opinion of, of my own off the bat, like judge it for you. And I think part of, that, part of the reason that worked is because her stories were so easy to tell, including my mother's stories in the, in the novel and having her tell you about herself, really. Right, and uh, those little vignettes, the vignettes. You do at the beginning of each chapter. Yeah, that they were very them. easy to write, in fact. They were very easy because they're almost like a rewind and play tape. She mm -hmm. told them so many times. Although so, she probably didn't tell the one about the van backing into the no, delivery. No, she didn't tell that one. That, oddly enough. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you have to read the book to find that one. There are two she didn't tell. That one and the Driving Miss Daisy one she also didn't, <laughs> didn't tell. But the others she was very proud of, and she told them all the time. Mm -hmm. So I, I remember them very well, and, and my brother also remembers them very well. So anybody who hung out with her knows those stories and knows that they're her interpretation, and they're very funny. Mm -hmm. So that was not hard to do. It was harder to find a kind of neutrality and not uh, do a mommy dearest type of book. Mm -hmm. That was very, very important to me. Uh, the book had to be a memoir. It demanded to be a memoir because I think it's one of those cases where you'd say, this is unbelievable. And the problem with fiction is fiction needs to be truer than fact in many ways. And I danced around these issues in my fiction for years, and I thought, well, now I have to tell this story mm -hmm. uh, as a memoir. What made you, what led you to that moment where you said, now I have to tell it as a memoir? I've done, because you've got in A Soldier's Daughter's Never, Never Cries, um, you uh, talk a, a little bit about a fictionalized version, or you, uh, you it's focused on, a, I believe, a fictionalized version of your childhood. That's right. I kind of, A Soldier's Daughter Never Cries is sort of structured as a fake memoir, as if a person much stabler than I was at the time that I wrote it grew up and looked back on that childhood with, you know, through kind of rose-colored glasses. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's fictionalized in that I took all the details and changed them to make the story work, whereas with the memoir, I had to work very hard to change my writing style to fit the story. Right? I had to follow the truth and sometimes my memory, I think memory is an unreliable, uh, you can't rely strictly on your own memory for a memoir. You have to ask other people's advice and opinions and get, get the facts straight a lot of times. And I think for the most part I, I had to back up a lot, of, uh, a lot of the facts that I remembered by, by speaking to the the archivists where my dad's papers are and going through photographs and old diaries and things like that. Uh, in some cases it was impossible to find out because a lot of the people are, are no longer around so there was no way to find out what was true and what wasn't. What do, you, what do you do in a moment like that when you don't know what's true and what's not? How do you handle it? Do you go with your own? I try experience? to say this was my mother's story. She told, you know, this is what my mother told me. I don't know if it's true. I think mm -hmm. I tried to make sure that, that I didn't say this is an absolute fact. This was a story my mother told and that mm -hmm. way if it is not true, uh, it's not that I did it out of any kind of meanness. It's that I didn't. I just didn't have all the facts. So that's the way I tried to handle the stories that were. My mother was a great storyteller, but she was a great exaggerator and also a great revisionist. She rewrote a lot of things that that she, you know. If she didn't like that part of the story, she just took it out. Mm -hmm. So that's true in many cases in these stories as well. So I had to be very careful and sometimes I was able to ask other people well what happened was that what happened and and if the information was solid I would put that into the book too mm -hmm. 
-hmm. to sort of show a different side of the story. How do you determine when the information is solid when it's been 20 or 30 years and you're talking to somebody else who was at the same event, but you're also relying upon sort of their faulty memory? Right. Well, my sometimes there were more than one. There was more than one person right. there, so I could talk to several people, and then I could also go back to the letters, the artifacts. You know, you know, my, my daughter's studying Egypt, Egypt and it's all about, about the artifacts. artifacts. What, what do they, they prove? prove? What do they show? Well, I have photographs, I have letters, I have all these different artifacts from certain periods that I can rely on mm -hmm. pretty solidly when, I, when I'm not sure of my own memory. And a soldier's daughter is very much about memory and about the lenses, the colored lenses through which we see the past. And I wrote A Soldier's Daughter about three years before I quit drinking myself. So my whole vision of the world was through those lenses too. Mm -hmm. This is a very different approach. And you've got one artifact that comes up a couple times in the book. Uh, your father had a bar installed uh, out of a church, or it was based on a church's altar, right? Pul pulpit. A pulpit. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> does that still survive? It's in storage. But it, it's a, it was around, it was about the size of this table, uh, beautiful dark wood carved, and it was open in the back, and it was about this far elevated off the ground. And he put prayer stools and other kinds of bar stools around it. And which was very offensive to to deeply Catholic people, but he didn't. Apparently, Bunuel, Bunuel got very upset that the director when he saw that uh, in our house. But apparently, they used it as a as the bar and also as a pulpit. So James Baldwin, for example, loved to get behind there and give sermons mm -hmm. to the point where they had to make a ten minute rule. After ten minutes, you had to give up the pulpit and let somebody else speak. And uh, that bar was. So it was so big and substantial that when we moved to Long Island, they had to take a wall out to get the bar into the house. Mm. And when I when we sold the house and I had to clean out my mother's house, I had to have a friend come in and take it apart, carpenter, because I couldn't get it out the door. Mm. Were, how old were you, or, or were you allowed to to take all the pulpit, take over the pulpit for your own sort of sermons, or did that not happen? Not really. I was 16 when my father died, mm. and by the time we moved to Long Island. A lot of that kind of wild, intemperate, uh, sort of salon atmosphere that I grew up with was gone. I mean, we still had parties, and it was still a bar, mm -hmm. but um, most they they dispersed after that. In the mid, I'd say early to mid '70s, that crowd kind of dispersed. Many of them ended up out in Long Island, but after my father passed away, it it, it sort of didn't um, happen very much anymore. Mm -hmm.